On the 25th of February 2022, the authorities announced they solved the 1987 cold case murder of 32-year-old Lee Rotatori. Lee was described as a mostly happy and outgoing young mother who had lots of friends. She had an artistic flair and loved horses. She lived in a mobile home with her second husband, Jerry Nemke, in Crockery Estates in Nunica, Michigan. Jerry was employed by a local service station and had a part-time job as a delivery man for a flower shop. Lee had a degree in food nutrition and dietary services and was responsible for establishing food programs for different hospitals in various areas. She drove alone for 600 miles to Council Bluffs, Iowa to start a new job as a food service director at the Jenny Edmondson Hospital, where orientation commenced on the 21st of June 1982. She stayed at the nearby Best Western Frontier Hotel while she looked for a permanent place to rent. On the afternoon of the 24th of June, she went boating with some newfound hospital friends along Lake Manawa. When the gathering broke up at around dusk, Lee stopped by a local McDonald's to pick up some dinner on her way back to the motel. When Lee didn't show up for work the following morning, her boss asked a hotel employee to check up on her. At just after midday, a motel staff member entered Lee's room to discover her lifeless body. She was on her back in her pyjamas, lying in a pool of blood on the right side of her bed, and the authorities were immediately contacted. The police arrived at around 12.27pm and found that she had been stabbed once in her chest penetrating her heart, and she'd been lewdly assaulted. There were no signs of forced entry into the room, or obvious signs of a struggle. Some of her personal items were missing, including her purse and jewellery. It was estimated that she'd been attacked around midnight. Evidence was collected at the scene and people were questioned, including her husband who had a strong alibi. But despite an extensive investigation, no suspects were identified and the case went cold. In 2001, the case was re-examined using the latest advances in forensic technology. The evidence collected in 1982 was sent to a crime lab for DNA testing, which confirmed the presence of a male DNA profile. It was entered into the CODIS DNA database, but no matches were found. In April of 2019, investigators partnered with the DNA specialist company Parabon, who used genetic genealogy to trace down the male suspect. Family trees were developed from the suspect's DNA, and ancestry websites were visited. They then narrowed their search down to suspect Thomas O. Freeman of West Frankfort, Illinois. The authorities tracked down the daughter of the suspect who provided a DNA sample. They confirmed the parent-child relationship, linking Thomas to the crime scene. Thomas was a trucker who was 35 years old at the time of the crime, and it's believed that he killed Lee while he was passing through the area. Detectives discovered that Thomas died in 1982 after being shot four times in the chest. Two deer hunters discovered his decomposing remains in a shallow grave in a wooded area, five miles southeast of Cobden, Illinois, on the morning of the 30th of October 1982. It's estimated that he'd been killed in late August or early September, within a couple of months of murdering Lee. Although Thomas's murder has not been found, the authorities believe that Lee's husband Jerry may have crossed paths with him. When Jerry was 17, he was arrested on the 2nd of May 1960 while driving a stolen car. He served time in prison for beating 17-year-old waitress Marilyn Duncan to death in Chicago a few days earlier, when she pleaded guilty to. He was released from prison in 1978, the same year he married Lee. After his release, Drew went to college in Carbondale, Illinois, which is about 26 miles outside West Frankfurt and 15 miles from Cobden, which is around the same area where Thomas lived and died. Drew passed away in 2019. Investigators are looking into whether Thomas's death was linked to his involvement in Lee's murder. On the 17th of February 2022, the authorities announced they solved the decades-old rape and murder cold case of 11-year-old Laura Ann Weiser. The events unfolded on the afternoon of the 6th of November 1983, when Laura was walking home alone in the streets of Fort Pierce in Florida after spending the night at a friend's house. She stopped by a convenience store located at 14,500 Okeechobee Road and made a purchase and then continued on her way. At around 1.30pm, she was within viewing distance of the driveway to her home when witnesses saw a uniformed patrol officer following her in his car. After that, Laura disappeared and never made it home and her father reported her missing that night. Three days later, a lifeless body was found by citizens in a citrus grove, roughly 600 yards from where she was last seen alive. She'd been raped and strangled to death, but the authorities couldn't locate the killer and the case went cold. In late 2019, 
Cold case detectives were hired to re-examine the case. Initially, no viable suspects were identified. However, people familiar with the original investigation confirmed that James Harrison was a first officer at the crime scene and had instructed two witnesses to leave the area approximately 20 minutes before additional law enforcement personnel arrived. Cold case detectives also learnt that the location and position of Laura's body, documented by initial crime scene investigators and detectives, differ from witnesses' statements. St. Lucy Detective Paul Taylor said the original investigators never went back to speak to the witnesses, adding that there was a lot of things missed in the initial investigation. After looking into the case, detectives established a probable cause and identified Deputy James Harrison as the person who abducted, raped, and murdered Laura. The authorities said that the location where Laura disappeared from and the location where she was found dead were within James's patrol zone. It is said that James altered the crime scene by placing Laura in a drainage ditch in an attempt to destroy physical evidence. The investigators also say that James had a checkered past, with a pattern of reports filed against him from co-workers for acting inappropriately towards juvenile females. It was revealed that he had worked for 10 different law enforcement agencies in Florida. Despite these complaints, not much was done and James would just move to a different post. Five months after Laura's murder, James resigned from the force amidst claims he violated children while performing preacher duties at the Bethel Baptist Church. It was also discovered that James died at the age of 73 from cancer in 2008. In 2021, the authorities hired a private lab to extract the male DNA preserved from Laura's rape kit. James's body was exhumed, but the DNA had degraded so much that a comparison couldn't be made. Despite this, the circumstantial evidence presented in the probable cause was enough to declare James as Laura's killer, closing a decades-old cold case. Detective Paul Taylor said the day solved the case was both the worst day and the best day of his law enforcement career. He said it felt bittersweet to finally provide the victim's family with some long-awaited answers. It's believed that James may be responsible for more attacks across the state. On the 17th of February 2022, the authorities arrested a man who they say is responsible for the 35-year-old cold case murder of 30-year-old Roxanne Lee Wood. The events unfolded at around midnight on the 20th of February 1987. Roxanne had spent the night out with her husband Terry Wood drinking at a bar and bowling. She decided it was time to make her own way home, located in Temeshanta Lane, just south of Niles in Michigan. Her husband left about 45 minutes after Roxanne, and when he arrived at the home at around 1.15am, he discovered his wife's lifeless body lying on the kitchen floor and 911 was contacted. When the authorities arrived, they found Roxanne's throat had been slashed with a knife. She'd been beaten over the head with a frying pan and she'd been lewdly assaulted. There were no obvious signs of forced entry from the front of the home. However, there were signs that the attacker entered through the back door. There were items strewn about on the floor. Terry said that Roxanne always kept items tidy and was sure the killer entered the rear door because it hadn't been properly secured. Detectives found a sheath at the crime scene but no knife. Divers spent hours searching a nearby creek hoping to find the murder weapon, but to no avail. Initially, Terry was looked at as the main suspect. A DNA sample was later collected from Roxanne's body, and it was put into the nationwide database, but there was no match and the case went cold. In August of 2020, the case was reopened and looked at with fresh eyes. Cold case detectives went through over 3,300 pages of documents, re-examined the original evidence from local police, and then conducted additional interviews and surveillance. In February 2021, investigators received information from a credible and reliable source, which pointed them to 67-year-old Patrick Gillum as a suspect. Lead investigator Chuck Christensen explained that the passage of time has helped, because relationships change, and people that maybe wouldn't have talked 15 years ago will now talk. Authorities discover that Patrick, a resident in South Bend, Indiana, had been in the region when Roxanne was murdered. At the time, he was on parole for burglary and criminal deviant conduct convictions out of Indiana. He had been released from prison only six months before Roxanne was murdered. In June of 2021, the investigators retrieved a cigarette butt that Patrick had thrown away. They then sent it to a lab for DNA testing, which was found to be a match to the DNA found on Roxanne's body. In late July 2021, Patrick was interviewed. He said he didn't go to Michigan, except for work while on parole. He said he didn't have any friends or girlfriends in Niles, and he didn't know where Tamashanta Lane was. He was shown photos of Roxanne, and repeatedly said he didn't know her. While the investigators explained that she'd been attacked, he began to breathe rapidly and his hands shook as he held them up. 
He asked for a lawyer, which brought the interview to an end. On the afternoon on the 17th of February 2022, Patrick was arrested at his home and charged with Roxanne's murder, as well as breaking and entering of an occupied building. He's been extradited to Michigan, and he's held on a $500,000 bond.